Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. As you probably know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Discipleship. These lessons are for the months of January, February, and March of 2013. And this is lesson number three in that series entitled Discipleship and Prayer. So we hope that you uh, have your Bibles handy. We're going to do quite a bit of looking at the Bible and the Scriptures. And so um, we would like to begin, as you might guess, with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, you've given us some pretty clear instructions and some wonderful examples of prayer and Scripture. May we understand and experience some of the things that your friends did in Scripture as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So what's the role of prayer in the life of a Christian? Well, I think it's pretty clear that if we didn't believe in God, we wouldn't pray, right? And sometimes we get this impression that you pray and your prayers don't get any higher than the ceiling. Well, that's okay too, because God is where? Everywhere. Everywhere. So even if it doesn't get above the ceiling, He still hears it, right? Yeah, I guess that's one way to explain that. Um, so we believe in God. Uh, what do we expect to happen when we pray? Is is prayer well? Does prayer change God? No. You sure? <clears throat> we pray like it was going to change God lots of times. Yeah, but isn't it important that what you that you reveal what you want to have happen. Microphone. You're not plugged in. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, does prayer change us? That would be the next question. Absolutely. And so, is that the purpose of prayer? Is the purpose of prayer to to to, to change us, to get us to take a different attitude, and so forth? Did Jesus say what the purpose of prayer was? I, not in just that many words. Uh, he, of course, twice taught his disciples how to pray. And those are things we call the Lord's Prayer. It's not really the Lord's Prayer. It's his prayer for us. The Lord's Prayer, more precisely, would be John 17. The prayer he prayed just before going to the, or just before entering the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, but, but isn't it when you pray, though, that you're, you're letting everyone know that you're for a certain direction? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're sitting there just letting whatever happens, well, then mm -hmm. what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. So you, you need to be able to pray to know what direction that, that your loyalty, what you, where you want to go. There are occasionally times when you pray when you have no clue which way to go. I was going to say that. <laughs> well, well, still, I yeah. mean, um, you, you, you got to let yourself, you, you got to make yourself clear yeah. on, you know, who you are, what you want to do, and what your thinking is of a certain point at that time. Now, we, we could have a long discussion about what percentage of your prayers do you think God answers and that kind of stuff. I'd, I would like to take the discussion in a little different direction. Are there certain things that we pray for, we can pray for, that God will always say yes? Think of anything that you, pretty sure God would always say yes. Well, God do the right thing. <laughs> God, like Abraham prayed, huh? Shouldn't God do all the right thing? Yeah, okay. That... If he if he always does it, I don't know. Well, well, we always pray for the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. but then we go out and drink again, I and see. we pray for the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and then we go out and smoke again, or mm -hmm. or rob a bank or something, and uh, or go out and eat again, or go out and eat eat too much again, the whole thing of ice cream again or something. Um, so God answers your prayer for the Holy Spirit, but how come it doesn't always take? We can't just yeah. say, give me the Holy Spirit, and then 
oh, we can just relax and uh, yeah. we're good to go. Well, let me make a suggestion. Do you think God would answer our prayer saying yes every time if we asked every morning him to help us witness to somebody that day? Hmm. Yeah, I was or on. I why was, that, that would be a problem because what you think is witnessing may not exactly and be the witness that he needs. And some, needs. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes God doesn't help us to witness because he knows what we would say was be wrong. Well, I, <laughs> I, was on, I was on a plane and you always hear like on these TV programs, if you're sitting on a plane, you should ask God, what you can witness to the people next to you. So one was asleep, they were both asleep, and I was in the middle. I said, okay, God, you know, supposedly you're gonna give me a situation or something. But anyway, so then there was an Asian man, and he woke up finally, and he talked about hoping he could solve the problem. He was going up to San Jose to solve his company's technical problem. He says, and I'm gonna cross my fingers. And I says, oh, I pray to God for wisdom. That's all I said, and I thought, well, that was one. So I thought, well, the other one's asleep. What's going to happen there? And uh, but anyway, came out. He was a private investigator, and uh, <laughs> then uh, he he was a, a, a charismatic Christian, and we got talking about this assisted living center Christian, and he said, um, and then he came out. He says, oh, you're an Adventist, and like I was the first one he had ever met, and. Uh, so anyway, I thought, well, if somehow religion came in the conversation with both of them, and I had no idea how it was going to happen because they were both sound asleep. Yeah. So if you ask. Well, here's some comment from Ellen White to get us started. Let the workers grasp the promises of God, saying, Thou hast promised, ask, and ye shall receive. I must have this soul converted to Jesus Christ. So you can ask to have what? to assist in converting somebody. Mm -hmm. Solicit prayer for the souls for whom you labor. Present them before the church as objects for the supplication. It will be just what the church needs to have their minds called from their little petty difficulties to feel a greater burden, a personal interest for a soul that is ready to perish. Select another and still another soul, daily seeking guidance from God, laying everything before him in earnest prayer and working in divine wisdom. Medical Ministry, pages 244 and 245. So, what, what is that saying? I mean, is it saying that um, we're praying for the soul, and are we going to get the answer to that prayer if we pray for that soul? Are you going to see it every Maybe. time? Maybe. I've, I don't know. I've never talked to anybody that... that got converted with a couple of sentences. No, I, this, this is asking God, you, this, this says you are asking God to help you witness to somebody that you know needs it. To, so he won't perish. Mm -hmm. But that, so he won't perish, how do you know that that's <laughs> happened? Well. I think it's also <laughs> saying another thing. I know when you're teaching, sometimes you could be so wrapped up in yourself and what and and so concerned about making a mistake or something or if you're doing it right you completely forget about those you're teaching and the important thing is is to concentrate on that person really see that person what they need answer their question mm -hmm. maybe the same for a doctor too and you actually completely change your whole uh, attitude and it's received wonderfully if your focus is on the other person and not mm -hmm. yourself. So to me that was saying um, focus on saving that soul on the other person and not so much on yourself. Okay, so let, let, me, let me make a suggestion. Try this sometime. Line up a collection of your prayers. Think about what you said. Maybe five of them or ten of them. And then look at them as closely as you can. And ask yourself how many of those prayers sound self-centered? Is God some kind of a s divine Santa Claus? Yes, come in. My prayers always start with worship. Okay. I believe because I start with thanking God and worshiping God, and somehow it always trickles down to God do this for me. 
<laughs> it may be just give me more wisdom, increase faith, something, watch over my children, but it's not like God give me, uh, you know, like a tangible material thing. I see. What would happen, you suppose, if a church, a whole church said, okay, for the next six months or something, we're going to focus on praying for other people? Think it would make a difference? Sure. Our church is doing that, isn't it? At 7 a.m. and 7 p.m.? Yeah. Not everybody, but yeah. Yeah. What if we actually prayed for our enemies? What would happen? They may not be our enemies anymore. <laughs> The best way to destroy your and get rid of your enemies is to turn them into friends? Mm-hmm. That kind of thing you mean? Perhaps. Well, there are a number of very remarkable prayers in the Bible that are excellent examples for us. And one of the best is found in Daniel chapter 9, starting with verse 2. I'm going to take time to read some of this. In the first year of his reign, I was studying the sacred, and it's talking about uh, the days of Darius the Mede. In the first year of his reign, I was studying the sacred books and thinking about the 70 years that Jerusalem would be in ruins according to what the Lord had told the prophet Jeremiah. Now this is very interesting. It it, it gives me some insight into how things worked in Old Testament times. Daniel was in Babylon. Jeremiah wrote this 70 year prophecy back in Jerusalem after Daniel was already in Babylon. So who, who brought a copy of this document, the whole, this great big scroll of Jeremiah. He, Jeremiah had his scroll chopped up and thrown in the fire, remember? The first copy. He had to do the whole thing over again. So who made a copy and sent it to Daniel? And how did Daniel know that Jeremiah was a prophet back in Jerusalem when Daniel was in Babylon? Well, th- well th- they, they were about the same age. So they maybe knew each other before Daniel was taken away from Jerusalem. Weren't they both uh, political leaders of some sort of the royal family? No, Daniel was a member of the royal family. Uh, Jeremiah was a priest. Okay, I was thinking he was no. royalty. Okay. I- Isaiah was royalty. Okay. Yeah. Jeremiah. Did things pass by word of mouth? Well, yeah, but n- you know, not 50 chapters of Jeremiah. Oh, gee. Well, I don't know. We just talked about Memorizing. people's memorizing big yeah. chunks of things. So I mean, do you think, are you saying Someone memorized it and then ran over to Babylon and told... It could be. I mean, we don't... The culture back then was a lot different than it is today. I mean, I don't memorize because I don't have to anymore. I can look it up. <laughs> well, we, anyway, in any case, we know that Jeremiah prophesied in two different places that the Jews would be able to come back home after 70 years. And however it happened, now Daniel knows about it. So he's talking about it. I prayed earnestly to the Lord God, pleading with him, fasting, wearing sackcloth, and sitting in ashes. This is the prime minister of the world empire at that point in time. He's doing all this. What's fascinating is Jeremiah said it, and Daniel believed it. Mm-hmm. I mean, and someone else could have said 60 years or 30, but since it came from Jeremiah, Daniel was counting on it. Yeah. Well, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed the sins of my people, Notice now he's identifying with who? His people. Israel. His people. I said, Lord God, you are great and we honor you. You are faithful to your covenant and show constant love to those who love you and do what you command. We have, si- we have sinned. Are there any sins recorded in the Bible about Daniel? No. None. Now, that, uh, we're not trying to say he wasn't, he wasn't uh, uh, a sinner at some point, but uh, we have no record of any sins recorded about Daniel. We have sinned, we have been evil, we have done wrong, we have rejected what you commanded us to do and have turned away from what you showed us was right. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and rulers and ancestors in our whole nation. And I'm going to jump over, and he goes on talking like that. I'm going to jump over to verse 16 so we don't use up too much of our time here. Um, Verse 16, you have defended us in the past, so do not be angry with Jerusalem any longer. It is, and now notice what he's saying, it is your city, your sacred hill. Who is he talking to? Yahweh. He's talking to a God. All the people in the neighboring countries look down on Jerusalem and on your people because of our sins and the evil evil our ancestors did. O God, hear my prayer and pleading. Restore your temple, which has been... Uh, destroyed. Restore it so that everyone will know that you are God. Who's he? What's he praying about? 
Listen to us, O God. Look at us. See the trouble we are in and the suffering of the city that bears your name. We are praying to you because you are merciful, not because we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. Daniel is praying for God's reputation, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's saying, what are, what are the people in the other nations around going to think about you, God, if, if your people are in such a bad shape? Now, it's our fault. I admit that. It's our fault. But what about your name? And what happens when we pray like that? God listens. <laughs> God listens. God listens. He always listens. Yeah. He always right. listens. But this is the yeah. time when he needs to do something. Mm. And if you, go, if you go through the Bible, and I, I would like to challenge all of you who are listening, watching, to try this sometime. If you go through the Bible and you look at places where people directly challenged God, God acts. Yeah. I read that prayer with new, new eyes, and I feel like I need to kind of incorporate it, but to different kind of things, but it's, it's a good prayer. Yeah. <laughs> good, so good strategy. So as one of God's people, or trying to be one of God's people, we have a right to ask for God to act in our lives to uh, make his character manifest. Well, I mean, and, and Jesus just said that in so many words, didn't he? Do you remember what it says in... in um, Matthew 5, 16. We can challenge God to make us good. Well, look at Matthew 5, 16. What's supposed to happen there? I like I get my Bible to go there. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise Father you, your Father. church, your Sabbath school. What? Give glory to your Father. Father. And praise heaven. your Father in heaven. Why are we... What's supposed to be happening here? God is supposed to be praised. Now, is this because God is some kind of selfish individual? Is he just there that he, he just can't wait until somebody else praises him? God does not need praise. He deserves praise. Of course, he deserves praise, but he is in not in need of praise. Mm -hmm. He wants, but we need to praise him because others can learn from from that experience. That's what he's that mm -hmm. Matthew five is saying. So, coming back to our basic question now, what does happen when we pray? It depends on what we pray. Okay. Hopefully it changes us, brings us into line with God's desires for us. Do any of us here have a question about whether God hears our prayers? Sometimes. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you question whether yes. God hears your prayers? Some of them, yes. Sometimes I do. I say, come on, God, what's going on? <laughs> Get to it. No. <laughs> well, sometimes I, I, I always feel like he listens. He can hear my prayers, but sometimes I wonder about my subjects, if he cares for them or not. <laughs> I see. The things you're praying for may not be his top priority. You mean? Yeah, yeah. Might be mine, but may not be his. I see. Okay, well... Let's look at a couple of passages in the New Testament. Look at Matthew 14, 20, starting with 22. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on. Now, this is, remember, our focus is prayer here. He made the disciples get into the boat and go. Now, the context. Jesus has preached to a huge crowd all day long. And things are going so well that the disciples are saying, Hey, this is our chance. Let's go. We're going to make him king. They were all ready to grab him, and, and they had the support of people. Man, if someone had said, let's make him king, they would have done it on the spot. And just about the time they, were, they thought they were going to do something like that, Jesus said, you, get in the boat. It's time to go back home. And they, Ellen White says they could not argue with him. They just did it. <coughs> there was no time for arguing. So after sending the people, he went up a hill for, by himself to pray. When evening came, Jesus was there alone, and by this time, the boat was far out on the lake, tossed about by the waves because the wind was blowing against it. Between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning, how long has Jesus been praying? Okay. Most of the night, right? Between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to the disciples walking on the water, and you know there was that experience with Peter and so forth. Okay? 
Now, there's other examples. I think this one is, let's see here. Try Luke 6. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. Now, how does that make you feel? We don't pray enough. Does it make you feel kind of you're, like your praying is a little bit uh, anemic? Sometimes it's depressing to pray. Mm -hmm. When you have a laundry list of things that are going wrong and people that are in trouble, I feel worse after praying than before. I prefer to um, thank God and, uh, for the good things than to concentrate on the bad things. Mm -hmm. It can be overwhelming when you start listing things. What, what do you think Jesus was doing in those whole night long prayers? Connecting with the source. Probably thinking a lot, too. Probably planning the next day also. I think probably a lot of those nights were, were, were spent in planning for the next day. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, conferencing together, thinking about what they're going to do the next day. And actually probably not just the next day, but the next month and the next year. Well, but we have lots more nights to practice for that, too. Well... <clears throat> Could we do that? Could we actually kneel down in the evening or maybe first thing in the morning even and say, okay, God, you and I need to plan my day. Well, what happened? Do you have that picture that he kneeled down the whole time? No, I'm just give that. No, no, I don't. Well, that's the first thing that comes to my mind of can I physically do that? kneel down and, and be in that position all night. But that, I don't think that's no. really a point right there. Now, he did this, this particular one we're talking about, his particular experience was just before he appointed his 12 disciples. Now, do you suppose he was going over the names? What do you suppose he was talking about that night? You know, when you pray to God to plan your day, I think all you can do is pray to God for the right attitude to, me, to, to react to whatever the day brings. Because what day have you ever planned that mm -hmm. has gone according to plan? I mean, all of a sudden you get a phone call, you get this, you get that, and all of a sudden your to-do list is uh, on the next day and you have to take care of everything on your plate. So it's better to be able to be the kind of person that can make the right decision again and again mm -hmm. and again in surprises. Mm -hmm. And do you think Jesus actually knew he was going to meet the demon, demonic person? Mm -hmm. Do you think he knew he was going to do that? Possible. Possible. There's very clearly times, Ellen White just says in so many words, the time went way up to Tyre inside, way, way up there. She says, Jesus knew about that woman and he went there specifically to meet her. And how did he know about that woman? Well, it would have to be his father told him. It's the only way he could know. Well, do you think Jesus enjoyed spending time with his father? Well, sure. Of course. Well, it depends. There's, there's a lot of things they probably have to deal with also, mm -hmm. which may not have been very joyous. Yeah. Okay. He's in a rebellious world, and he's here praying for us. I mean, that could be depressing, too, because he has so much riding on his yeah. shoulders. Well, Ellen White comments about what real prayer is. This is the Steps to Christ, page 93, paragraphs 1 and 2. Through nature and revelation, by the way, well, let me finish this first, and then we'll ask that question. Through nature and revelation, through his providence, and by the influence of his spirit, God speaks to us. Okay, we're, we're talking about conversations here, right? So God speaks through nature, revelation, his providence, the influence of his spirit. But these are not enough. We need also to pour out our hearts to him. In order to have spiritual life and energy, we must have actual intercourse with our Heavenly Father. Our minds may be drawn out toward him. We may meditate upon his works, his mercies, his blessings, but this is not in the fullest sense communing with him. 
In order to commune with God, we must have something to say to him concerning our actual life. Now, um, if you're talking to a friend, what do you talk about? Yes, stuff. Things happening in your life. Yeah, what's, what's, what's happening with you today or yesterday or the day before or something like that. Whatever's happened to you since the last time you saw them, right? Okay, she goes on to say, Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it's necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to Him. Steps to Christ again, 93. And when we're talking friend to friend, heart to heart, mm -hmm. even the little things are important to discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, just the little tidbits of the day to um, help each other. Yeah. So God is interested in even the little tidbits of the day because mm -hmm. so many tidbits makes, you, makes the kind of person you are. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you listen to some conversation of women, you'd say, you know, why are they talking about that? But it's all important to orient yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think no prayer is too small. I, okay. used to, I used to pray all the time. I used to say a few expletives here and there. And I used to play, pray and pray, God out, I don't want to say any bad words. I don't want, and one night I, I prayed for at least 30 minutes, basically on that one thing. I went to sleep, I was happy. And I woke up in the morning, I was going to the bathroom, and I hit my toe so hard. And I must have let out like 10 expletives. And my day was ruined. And my day was absolutely ruined. That night I was like, oh my God, I give up. But thank God, it, he answered my prayer la later on. I stopped saying bad words most of the time. Maybe he was giving <laughs> you one last time, huh? <laughs> Empty out the basket or something. Uh -huh. Well, Jesus suggests some pretty amazing things about prayer. And by the way, as we're moving along here, if you would be interested in getting the handouts that we use in our discussions here, they are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G. It should be there on your screen. Look at these things that Jesus suggests about prayer. Is it really true that we could move mountains? Now, I've heard all sorts of explanations about this. This means mountains of difficulty. Is that what Jesus was talking about? No. Or is he talking about real mountains? So, and if, if, if that's really what Jesus is talking about, have you ever heard of a Christian moving a mountain? No. So, uh, we don't have any real Christians. And you, did Jesus say we could move a mountain? That's what he says, yeah. You could say this mountain, cast yourself into the sea, and it would do it. There you go. You can practice on San Gorgonia if you want. <laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't. We, we, we have enough earthquakes around here already. So uh, is, is that a correct translation, that uh, if you tell the mountain to move, yeah. it would? A mountain mountain or an emotional mountain? No, a mountain mountain. No, that. So what, what is Jesus trying to say to us there? Well, we can do a lot through prayer. Yes. Okay, it does say that. Faith. We're also supposed to, supposed to pray according to his will, right? Mm -hmm. So if it was his will for the mountain to move and you prayed for it to move, you think it might move? Oh, that's the missing ingredient? Well, yeah. Sure. Well, he didn't say anything about that. Well, he did. I, I, I took two things right out of his prayer. One, we're supposed to pray according to his will. That's in there. You're not arguing with that. It's in there, are you? No. And the other says you can move mountains. Well, it looks like the problem is we don't know his will. Nobody has because I've go. never seen anybody yeah, I think, move a mountain. <laughs> I think that's tricky. We, we want God's will, but we don't know what God's will is. Mm -hmm. And so all you can pray is for God's will, but I know it's sort of like you have two things in hand. Okay, God, mm -hmm. is this your will or is this your will? Mm -hmm. If I choose this one, it's going to be this one. And if I choose this one, I, you know, I don't know. What is God's will? Well, well now, let's God's see. will is this. 
isn't it? Isn't it that when you I read, mean, study I mean, this, you I mean, study you a tricky problem. You know, what is God's well? Will? This is this is where you get it. And Ellen White says that the the that's the only part about the Bible that's infallible because the, as far as knowing God's will, that's where you get it from this book. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself said, Would any of you who are fathers give your son a snake when he asks for a fish? Or would you give him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? Bad as you are, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more then will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What about that? Praying according to the will, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane asked, Father, if it's your will, may this cut pass from me. May I not have to die. Yeah. At, you know, if it's according to your will. Okay. Is that the kind of praying according yes. to God's will we're supposed to do? Yes. So we leave it open? How did Jesus yeah. know for finally that God's will was not that the cup, that, that he would have to drink of the cup? How did Jesus finally know that was God's will? He, he communicated with God. Even from childhood, he communicated with God. But he talked to him. The situations didn't change either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Well, look at this. I mean, let's use his words. John 14, starting with verse 12. I am telling you the truth. Those who believe in me will do what I do. Yes, they will do even greater things because I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask for in my name. Whatever you ask for in my name. So that the Father's glory will be shown through the Son so what are we supposed to be asking for? God's name. God to be glorified, right? If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. So is, I, is I think that, that's not a crazy notion. No, just a minute. Is that what that means when you ask for something in my name, you're asking for God to be glorified? You're not asking for a million dollars in the no. name of Jesus? No. You have to put it in the context or in which it is. Or a new Cadillac uh -huh. in the name of Jesus. You're asking in the name of Jesus that God will be glorified? That's, well, it, it seems to suggest in that passage that if we pray for the Holy Spirit and we really understand things and we're in tune with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus, then what we ask for would be something that will lead to praise for God's name. Just like back in Matthew 5, 16, we're supposed to do good things and who's supposed to get the praise? God is. So. so one of our prayers is, who said, oh God, give me a clean heart? That was uh, uh, David. David in Psalm 51. After he sinned? Mm -hmm. I keep thinking about Elijah. Whenever somebody is trying to capture him, he says, if I'm a prophet of God, may you be struck by lightning or whatever. <laughs> and it happened over and over again. Um, was he doing God's will there? I think so. And think why so. would I say that? What was the context? Remember that the, the king at that point was trying to send someone down to Ekron to inquire from the god of flies. Now, what happens if your king, who's supposed to be worshiping the true god, is sending emissaries to Ekron to, give, to get a message from the god of flies? Is that a problem? Well, yeah, you're you're <laughs> correct there. But there was another thing, though. It was the soldiers that went after him. After a while, they started saying, well, you know, I was sent out here to do this, you know, and, and I'm sure that some of those that came okay, got zapped anyway. Wonderful. <laughs> you, you've just demonstrated my point. What did they learn? What did they learn? Yeah. What, what, did they, what did the king, what did everybody learn from that experience? You don't mess around with God's men. <laughs> Well, m maybe if we talk to a God who has some real power, we don't have to go to the God of flies. Wouldn't that be a reasonable conclusion? Well, um, is that how God wanted, to, wanted us to see him? Well, I mean, that we walked up and get zapped? <laughs> okay. Well, okay, now let's, let's talk about this for a second. Okay. There are a lot of people who feel like, even on TV, you see preachers preaching this all the time. Boy, if we just had more faith, there would be more miracles, right? Yeah. Okay, if you look in the Bible, when are the times when there are most miracles? Well, there was... Jesus. There, was, there were the, the, the plagues and the exodus. There is 
the times of Elisha and Elijah, and there's the times of Jesus. Those are the three major times when there's lots of miracles. Were those times of great faith? Nope. Those are times of minimum faith. So God is sending miracles to try to help people to wake up and realize how bad things are. So if there are no miracles today, it's because we have so much faith? Well, I don't think it's that we have so much faith. It's be, it's, we're not in a crisis mode yet. That time's yes. coming. That time's Close. coming. Why yeah. do we say there's no miracles today? How do you know that? I didn't that? say none. I'm just saying, uh, let's pick out the times when there's lots of miracles, and these are the times when there are lots of miracles. Because, and, oh, yes. sorry, I believe there are miracles, but we uh, attribute them to other things. I believe there are still I, miracles. Well, yeah, I, could, I can tell you, I know of at least two cases where Adventist missionaries, one in Bangladesh and the other in the Philippines, actually experienced someone being raised from the dead. And they were involved in, the, in that process. Now, I, I don't know, to me that sounds like a miracle. Yes. So? It seems to happen there, but not here. Well, I, I, I think the I think God is, two things are happening here. I think the first thing is that on the devil's side, he's trying to be, play it very quiet right now. He doesn't want the people think that he even exists. And why doesn't he want people to think he exists? So that when he does perform miracles, they'll attribute the miracles to God and say, this is the person that we should follow. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So if suddenly people start, someone starts doing miracles, must be God, right? Okay. Um, look, at, look at some other examples. Look at Matthew chapter 6. When you pray, do not use a lot of meaningless words as the pagans do, who think that their gods will hear them because their prayers are long. Now, can you think of a modern example of that? You mean there's, there's not really that much meaning to them? They're just long, as I was regarding Some of our pagan friends. You and mean the rosary? Well, rosary would be one. Another example is our Hindu friends. Yeah. They, they set up little prayer wheels that are like by a stream of the water, and the, uh, the water keeps going, and the prayer wheel goes, and the idea is that every time the wheel goes around, another prayer goes to God. Is that a little repetitious? Some of our verbal prayers are like that also. Now, just a minute. You're getting a little too close to home now. Well, at least that... I didn't say yours. I said some <laughs> of our, maybe mine. That, that kind of solves the problem, doesn't it? At least you don't have to do the repetition. You get the mechanical thing to do it. I see. I know a <laughs> Christian guy, uh, when he sing, when this, his church sings praise music, he says he will do the verse three times, and then he won't sing anymore until they get to another word, if they repeat. like It sounds like um, a friend I had who got a little bit tired of those kind of songs, and he said, um, we have... Today we have a lot of 711 songs, <laughs> seven, rep seven words repeated 11 times. Yeah, 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 so. Okay, so, and then Jesus gives an example of prayer. Our Father in heaven, may your holy name be honored, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us today of the food we need, forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done, us, done to us. Do not bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. And um, there are people who have real problems with this, but I can tell you that the oldest documents, either in Matthew or in Luke, where the, both places where this is repeated, there's no doxology on the end. So how did the doxology get there? Did man think that prayer was not good enough and they wanted to no, add? No, no, no. Oh. Try another idea. <laughs> well, they saw in the Old Testament they're examples of nice prayers that end with a doxology. And they got used to doing that, and now Jesus gave them a short prayer, and they said, well, shouldn't we end with a doxology? And they just put it in. The doxology is nice. It gives yeah. you time to sure. reflect on the prayer. Sure. Okay, when we pray, and especially we ask you for... Clarify, some, the doxology being, what for is thine the is the kingdom. Thine is the kingdom and power, and so that was, yes. And the glory forever. forever. I mean, yeah. So, which is... Basically, a glorified amen. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, some Bibles have it, some don't. Some Bibles have it and some don't. Oh. Bibles that were copied from or were translated from 
later trans later copies have it and Bibles that are translated from earlier copies don't have it. So they decided to keep it out. Some Bibles did because it's it was a later it. yeah, later edition. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they wanted to be And it's not wrong. It's just that it wasn't there in the original. Mm. And you're free to put it back in any time you want. Well, when we pray for something, we're, most of us, when we pray, we're, we're thinking about something we want to pray for. Are we taking into consideration the entire context? What would the entire context be? The onlooking universe. I don't think I've ever thought of that when I pray. I mean, when, aren't we, when we pray for something, we're asking, okay, God, in light of the entire great controversy and the entire onlooking universe, I think this is what I'd like to ask for. Do we do that? That it makes some of the things that we ask for kind of petty, doesn't it? It might seem a little like that sometimes, yes. Yeah. Well, following the example of Jesus, we're taught to pray that God's will be done. Do we always want that? No, we have to pray for the Holy Spirit to want God's will. Yes. And how often do we pray for our will to be done. Well, what happens when our will becomes God's will? Then how are you going to tell the difference? Well, if our will is the same as God's will, I don't think there's any problem. Well, when do you know that point? When do you get to the point that you know that it's that way? That is a, a relatively, not a simple, it, it's easy to answer, but it's not easy to do. <laughs> the answer is, study your Bible until you get so familiar with the way God operates in the Bible that you will be able to tell because the Holy Spirit will be working through you. He will say, yeah, that's God's way. That's, I mean, otherwise, what we're saying is we don't have a clue what God's will is. I hope not. But it seems like when you pray the first time, you, you, you're, you're expressing some will, yeah. some... Okay, well, I, I, I know what you mean. So let's, let's talk about some other examples. Think about the example of Peter in the upper room. What happened? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, you're all going to abandon me tonight, right? And what did Peter say? Not me. Not me. I, I'm, I'm willing to die with you. And what happened? Mm -hmm. He denied him three times, right? What should we learn from that? We're not as brave as we think we are. <laughs> yeah, okay. What, what do you think was happening there? When, um, okay, uh, I have all this courage now, but then afterwards you don't have it anymore. Was that the Lord taking it away from him, or he never had it in the first place? Or, or what, was he, what was he going with when he says, there's no way I'm going to stay with you to the end? I think Peter met it, but when, oh, yeah. yeah, he met it with all his heart. But I think when things started to really happen and the gravity of everything just shook him to the core, that he reacted the way he reacted. Afterwards, again, his feeling changed again. He felt I can imagine how awful he felt. Yeah. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. You know, it's just it's. I, but I believe he was meant to be, so we could learn a lesson. But Judas, you know, kind of did the same thing, kind of. Uh, did the Benedict Arnold from um, another type of thing? Way. From well, I think it's about the same though. I don't think so. Uh, because um, I, I think the only difference is that um, Peter forgave himself, and Judas didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, and Peter was willing then to go and ask God forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. He he sought forgiveness from everybody, God Himself, and whoever He let down. But um, Judas, um, he couldn't forgive himself at all. He says, I too much. did the, uh, you know, I betrayed innocent blood. Yes, and okay, hung himself. so one of the major, major, maybe the biggest goal in scriptures that we're challenged to do is to become like Jesus. Is that just folly? Is that, um, I mean, is, is that just sort of a, a distant goal there. We just sort of need to keep moving in that direction. 
What do you think? We're all. I, what was the purpose of our creation, or the creation of the angels? It was to be in the it's, image of God. Yeah, and and um, they're. What they're heading for is to be a representation of God. And I think it's something that they're working for, working towards to get better and better at. And there was, uh, there's this assisted living center for missionaries. You have to spend at least 10 years out in the mission and mission field. And, it, and uh, it's a group home, houses, and then depending on what level care you need. Every November they put on a, it's called Pilgrim Place, they put on a pilgrim. The ladies dress up in pilgrims costumes and some dress up like Indians and they play the drums and pretend that it was, it's in America during the Mayflower days. The lane is called Mayflower Lane. And to be in that atmosphere feels so good. I told my nephew, this is the closest you'll get to heaven on earth. You could definitely feel the people. I think you did see Jesus in their faces and the whole atmosphere and they're open to the community and it's a place like I have never felt before. Mm. You could almost feel the atmosphere. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I think when people try to become like Jesus, maybe they don't consider themselves different, but when you're amongst them, you're going, this is some kind of special place. And maybe our assisted living centers are the same. You know, the Adventists, it's full of the older Adventists. You can really feel it. Yeah. And so you look at this person who's gray and wrinkled and bent over, but you can feel Jesus in them. Mm -hmm. For me, the idea of trying to become like Jesus is, seems like an impossibility. When I'm talking about myself or what I'm capable of, the only way I can hope to be that is by relying on what Jesus did in, at, you know, on the cross. There's an interesting expression, which I'm sure that you've all heard at one time or another, called imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Now, I'm not real comfortable with the word flattery, but wouldn't be the greatest praise we could possibly give God would be to copy Him as much as possible in our lives? We're made in His image, mm -hmm. so that was must have been where it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this expression, I looked it up in, the, in some of the dictionaries and so forth. It was, a, it was originally made by a, uh, Charles Caleb Colton in Lacan, or many things in few words, written back in 1820. And his version was, imitation is the sincere, sincerest of flattery. We've sort of added a little bit to that. So, um, I, I don't think God thinks we're, you know, sometimes people say, how come you're trying to imitate somebody else? Like that was a bad thing. And trying to imitate God is the very best thing we can do. Well, well, God is the most creative, helpful. Um, he has a humor and everything. What is the matter with trying to pattern ourselves after God? That means that we would be, do good creations for this world, invent things. Uh, we would be helpful to people. Um, and God has roses and tulips and everything. It doesn't mean you're all going to be exactly like little soldiers marching mm -hmm. together, but you're in your area, you're going to be uh, God. If you could think, look through the, through the Bible and try to think of a time when maybe the most remarkable thing happened as a result of prayer. The sun went backwards. That, that's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pentecost. Pentecost. Wow. Maybe just before Pentecost in preparation. Let me read you a few words from Ellen White. This is Acts of the Apostles, page 37. Uh, what, she, what she comments about those days just before Pentecost. The disciples prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet men in their daily intercourse to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. Who were they praying for? Sinners. They're praying for sinners. Putting away all differences, all desire for the supremacy, they came close together in Christian fellowship. Could that happen with a church or a Sabbath school in our day? Yes. They drew nearer and nearer to God. And as they did this, they realized what a privilege had been theirs in being permitted to associate so closely with Christ. 
Sadness filled their hearts as they thought of how many times they had grieved him by their slowness of comprehension, their failure to understand the lessons that, for their good, he was trying to teach them. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to God for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighed with the burden of the, weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world and they claimed the power that Christ had promised. And what happened? Well, we know what the story of Pentecost, don't we? And even though they didn't feel capable, Jesus and the Holy Spirit gave them the power to, and they were successful. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them if they were successful, would they have said that they were successful? That time? Probably not. They were have always felt insecure and dependent on, God, you need to help me today. Well, I mean, I look at that two ways. There's no question about the fact that Peter and Paul, the ones, those are maybe the ones we know the most about. They were brave. They, they just went out there in places that we would, the Christians should have considered to be extremely dangerous, and they won souls for the gospel. So they weren't, it wasn't like they didn't have courage, but... Um, well, they didn't have courage until after they prayed. Yeah. Okay. So what are we supposed to talk? We're, in the few minutes we have left, what are we supposed to talk about with God? Everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. Every little thing we want to talk about. <clears throat> Think about what you would talk to your best friend about. And we're supposed to do it in the name of Jesus and, the whole, and or the Holy Spirit. Meaning, hopefully, that we are gradually orienting our lives to be in accordance with God's will, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the Bible gives us examples of the church praying for Paul and Barnabas before they send them off on missionary journey. And Paul later prayed with a group that he, he stopped and visited them for a little bit and they prayed for him as, as he was on his way. So what about it? Have we made a conscious effort to practice intercessory prayer? Praying for somebody else to see what would happen? It has been suggested, and I think this is a good idea. Take a little a little notebook, something that you can, you know, you don't need a it doesn't need to be a large a lot of space. And think about the things that are really important to you that you pray about. Write them down. And come back six weeks later and see what happened. You'll be amazed at the number of things that apparently God helps you answer just in a quiet and subtle way, even in our day. Some years ago, there was a movement among Adventists uh, that I know about that seems to suggest that if you get enough people together and you're all praying for something, it would have to happen. Is that a, is that a good way to go? Well, I was thinking of uh, God's people in year Egypt for all those years. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they were praying and nothing happened and a generation died. And so... It doesn't always happen. And the Babylonian captivity, same story, right? Surely they must have been praying then, mm -hmm. get us out of here. But when the opportunity came to leave, most of them didn't leave. Yes. Oh, wow. There are Christians who feel like, and this would be almost like a hermit or a monk's kind of uh, existence or a nun, that all you need to do is pray. Ellen White commented about that. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray. Or his prayers will become a formal routine. And we know some examples of that, don't we? When men take themselves out of social life, away from the sphere of Christian duty and cross-bearing, when they cease to work earnestly for the Master, who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. They cannot pray in regard to the wants of humanity or the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom, pleading for strength, wherewith to work. They can't pray for those things. Why? They're not involved, right? Steps to Christ, page 101. So you're supposed to immerse yourself in life and mm -hmm. pray, pray, pray. Mm -hmm. What would happen if the church actually, or maybe even one Sabbath school class in a church said, okay, we're going to do this for three months. What do you think would happen? Would it stunt our growth? Well, the 
<clears throat> can you do that and not do anything? That's that's your well, first point. Yeah. You get a whole bunch of people together and they just pray and that's all they do. I don't think anything's going to happen. It doesn't matter. But if you get people together and say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray that this is going to happen. And then, then you've got something going there. Okay. Now, we, we've suggested earlier that prayer is a kind of conversation. What does God say in the prayer? Inspiration, ins inspiring your mind. Okay, and what else? Is that all? That's the spirit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Anything else? How does God speak to us? Uh, providence. Through the yeah, through the Bible. I mean, that's one of the main purposes of the Bible. And when it talks about in, in accordance with the Spirit's will, where is the Spirit manifested? The Spirit is the one that inspired the Scriptures, right? So we are working with the Spirit if we're studying our Bibles. And you probably all heard this, but there are three things. If you, if you look carefully through the Scriptures, through the writings of Ellen White, and you look at the things that we're specifically instructed to do, it's Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. That's what the, those are the basic essentials of the Christian life. So are we doing those things? Well, I think we've answered the question that prayer is not for the purpose of changing God, it's for the purpose of changing us. One more question I want to talk about just very briefly. You know the famous verse in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray at all times, or as the King James says, pray without ceasing. Can we do that? We just keep God in our thoughts. But you okay. are running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, a famous theologian a few years back said, praying without ceasing is really just thinking toward God. And I think that's a fair. We, if, we were, if we were trying to keep our minds constantly focused on the fact that in every activity, God is present, how would that affect us? I think that there's a great deal for us to learn about prayer. A lot of us haven't taken it seriously, myself I think included. The time has come for us to pray that we will be more like Jesus. See you next week.